Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Not only were Andretti rejected, but they were eviscerated. I mean, seriously, this entire plot's turning into cool runnings almost to a T. And the FIA has responded to all of this, saying that they are going to look into engage in dialogue to figure out what they will do next. What I can tell you right now is that this is not going to be over, that the FIA has got Andretti's back and they will be trying to figure out a solution in where the team can participate and that Formula One will get what they deserve. And I could probably guess what you think Formula One management deserves, but let's try and keep it civil here, folks. I think you've heard by now that Formula One has made its next move in blocking Andretti from competing in the immediate future, ideally trying to kick the can down the road to 2028 when General Motors plan to start supplying power units to would-be customers. I reckon Formula One's ideal scenario here would be that they would be rejecting this bid that Michael Andretti would just take his toys and go home back to the US and continue on there, maybe come back later or maybe not at all, and that will probably get something similar to what Michael Andretti went through back in 1993 when he and McLaren parted ways on mutually based consent, realising that the sport wasn't really for him. But Stefano, I can tell you right now, the Michael Andretti of 1993 no longer exists. This is a whole other beast. You do not upset the likes of Mario Andretti. He was devastated by this news. How could you make him upset like that? How dare you? Now today I want to go into detail as to the reasoning behind F1 rejecting Andretti. And I can immediately tell you that this was going to go against Andretti no matter what they did, no matter what kind of presentation they offered, and Formula 1 had to come up with something that was really, really steeped in legalese to justify every single point as to why they were going to say no. This couldn't be one simple little statement and then be done with it, no. It had to be almost 50 1500 words in length. This is the span of a short essay. Whereas Andretti were able to respond in a paragraph and get almost as much meaning from it. Let me show you right now. Ahem. Andretti Cadillac has reviewed the information Formula One Management Limited has shared and strongly disagrees with its contents. Andretti and Cadillac are two successful global motorsports organizations committed to placing a genuine American works team in Formula One, competing alongside the world's best. We are proud of the significant progress we have already made on developing a highly competitive car and power unit with an experienced team behind it, and our work continues at pace. Andretti Cadillac would also like to acknowledge and thank the fans who have expressed their support. That short and sweet statement, coupled with the absolute word salad that Formula One statement was all about, tells you plenty of stuff. First, it mentions that Andretti and Cadillac are both indeed successful, multiple Indy 500 victories, just one of their achievements, that they are going to be a genuine American Formula One team, a shot across the bow to the likes of Haas who are suckling the Tita Ferrari, and that they have made significant progress with their development for 2025 and 2026, that they feel confident that they can make those deadlines, and that they are aware that this is what the Formula One fans want to see. You see, Andretti can read the room and they read it well. They could convey all that in just one paragraph effectively, whereas F1 had to resort to nearly 1500 words of waffle to basically say, we don't think it's worth it and that it's nothing personal. F1's trying its best to appeal to American audiences, but what it's doing right now is just appealing to American money makers. And that, oh, Williams are doing their best. They've got an American driver and they've got the daughter of Ken Block in their academy. Isn't that good enough for you? Well, okay, it kind of is. If you get a block member in your team, then okay, that's decent, but it could be better. But I would beg to differ. This is completely personal. Now you see, for the last year or so, the big wigs at Formula One management and the majority of the team principals have gone on record to say that they are critical of Andretti joining the sport. Even the likes of the paragon like James Vowles has been against it. The overall sentiment was flat out negativity and no need to have an 11th team, despite the fact that we had 11 teams recently, as recently as 2016. For me, this was just gonna go nowhere. They had made their minds up already and no matter what Andretti would present to them, they were going to say no about it. But they couldn't say no immediately because that would be incredibly obvious that they were biased against them. And despite all of the objective criteria that they laid out in their investigation and their assessment, it can come down to subjective implementation of those objective criteria. And what we've seen in the last 12 months, there is a degree of subjectivity here. Even though the team principals weren't supposedly consulted with this assessment from Formula 1 management. They were. They were. Just off the record. Now I want you to imagine you're in charge of applications for something. Doesn't matter what. 
You get this application from somebody you know you don't like and you won't gel well with and it could upset your current workforce. Even though your business partner has given them a glowing reference and has justified that they like what they have seen, so therefore you have to then make a big convoluted long-winded response as to why this person will not be suitable for joining your organization. You would have to go into that application and go through every single detail and nitpick the smallest of the minutiest of things and no matter what they could say to try and justify and explain it, your mind has already been made up and you are just going to rejected no matter what they do which is exactly what has happened here so i'm going to go through all of the general assessments that formula one management has made and debunk them to the best of my ability and if you like what you're about to hear then maybe like the video so that means more people can see this thank you but one important thing i would like to mention here is a quote from the art of war by sun tzu if you know yourself but not the enemy for every victory gained you will also suffer defeat I replace the word yourself with formula one management and the enemy with fans and you'll start to get an idea about what's going on here. Sure, Formula One management has gotten the victory in denying Andretti an entry for the next couple of years, but they have lost the battle in terms of social media and the appeal of the fan base. And probably they will lose a few more battles in the months to come, because social media, it's constantly evolving. First off, they have assessed that an 11th team, regardless of who it is supposedly, would not provide value to the championship unless it were immediately challenging for podiums or even race victories and thusly provide audience interest. Now, from what I have read here, the only way that a team could be justifiably allowed into the club that is Formula One, a statement made by Martin Brundle, is that they would have to be coming in and immediately toppling the likes of Max Verstappen, Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes. They would have to be scoring podiums to be allowed in. And that is completely and utterly unrealistic. Most of the time, it's going to be taken up by Red Bull drivers, Ferrari drivers, McLaren drivers, and Mercedes drivers. You might get some from Aston Martin, Alpine, and maybe once in a blue moon, you might get the likes of Williams at a certain track, but it's really, really rare for even the established teams to get a look in when you've got the likes of Red Bull and Max Verstappen around. It's completely unrealistic. It's impossible for any team to do that in their first season. Haas, they were not challenging for podiums or race victories. They were lucky to score points and they were able to do so. So instead, the way that Andretti has made waves is by just toppling the old guard and upsetting them, rubbing them up the wrong way by being very vocal on social media. Which is not the way that the old guard of Formula One do things. They like to do things behind the scenes, talk about things in private, which is why that little additional point about that meeting that Andretti had been invited to on December the 12th might have been a sticking point that Andretti refused the invitation. Now, of course, we have to take things into consideration here. What were the terms of that meeting? What would Andretti have to agree with for it to even happen? Was it on or off the record? Who would be present? And what would be discussed exactly? Is it going to be something to do with the assessment? Or was it just a sussing out period and trying to size up the opponent? We don't know the details about that meeting and Andretti might have been told by their legal team to not accept that invitation because it might not have been in their best interest. So they were being cautious. We again don't know the details of that meeting. If we did, then we would think differently. But a way they have been doing things differently is engaging with the fans by being open and transparent with their progress and then being a family run operation in the eyes of manufacturer teams who are obsessed with money. Which is why two of the teams now are basically billboards for the likes of gambling companies and uh, financial stuff. But according to Formula One management, it doesn't matter unless it can bring in the right kind of money that benefits the shareholders and broadcasters. I think I can tell you for sure, Formula One management, that Andretti simply being in Formula One would generate a huge amount of American interest simply for the fact that the Andretti name is a household name in the United States. Even for people who don't know motorsport, most of them would be at least aware of what Andretti is as an entity. And then if they figure out that, oh, they're in this brand new sport that's international. OK, cool. There's at least that awareness. And even if they weren't getting podiums and victories, the fact they were even in the mix and getting some regular points or at least a few points would be something that they could produce a Formula One car and immediately be somewhat competitive again. Haas were not expecting to get victories or podiums in their first season. They got eighth place, which was good enough to show that, OK, this kind of customer team entity was able to be in the mix and not five or six seconds down the road. So what's become clear right now is that you have to be a race winner to even get a look in to being in Formula One. 
completely unrealistic, especially with Max Verstappen around. Then there is the reservation of General Motors not coming with Andretti before 2028, and that the supposed tie-up with Renault is supposedly not good enough. This being mooted from previous rumours and news cuttings, as well as something pointed out by F1 Unchained's analysis of the airbox of the wind tunnel model being similar to Alpine's airbox, suggesting a hypothetical Renault power unit. And hang on a minute! Does this wording and phrasing that a customer engine deal for Andretti would be simply not good enough? Isn't that a little bit of a slap in the face to the likes of the Renault Group, who are an engine manufacturer, that they have been linked to Andretti to provide engines, and they seemed quite enthusiastic about the deal and they were willing to offer? The way that Formula One management have portrayed this is that this would be a compulsory deal, a shotgun wedding almost, that it would be a reluctant situation and a linking that wouldn't be ideal to the sport of Formula One, that they would not really be competing together. Well, I think Renault would like to have a word about this, that this is kind of insulting their own place in Formula One. And one thing I have learned in life is that you do not insult a Frenchman and you do not insult a French company when the governing body of the sport is French operated, FIA is a French acronym. And I think Renault would have appreciated having a second team on the grid again, the last time they had that was with McLaren, just to have that extra time on the road, that little bit of extra cash from a customer, and also those extra miles and R&D to try and build up their own power unit. Then there's the bit regarding saying most of the attempts to establish a new constructor in the last several decades have not been successful. Now hang on a minute here, of course they haven't been successful. Think about it, for the longest time, up until 2003, only the top six finishers would score points. And most of the time, it would be a mixture of McLaren, Williams, and Ferrari. Most teams wouldn't even get a single point in their entire operation. Sometimes you might get a freak result with a random team getting several points, or maybe an occasional podium with the likes of Leighton House, Ivan Capelli, and all of that stuff. Whenever Minardi would get points, it was a huge celebration, a big deal. To them, a single point would be like a race victory. A lot of the times, these teams went in just hoping to qualify hoping to get a point. So understandably, a lot of teams would not have been successful because a lot of the bigger teams who could spend way more and test as long as they want, took all of the, all of the accolades. And if they're referring to the whole thing that happened with HRT, Lotus and Virgin, no, 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 no. You cannot use that argument simply because they were sold a pup. They could barely scrabble something together in time of the rejection of the cost cap. At least they were able to show up and had a car that moved, which is a huge achievement in of itself. They had the rug pulled out from under them and they barely had a leg to stand on. So the fact that even the likes of Hispania turned up to Bahrain and had a car that exited the pits, big deal. And those teams, despite all the stuff that was going against them, you had Mana surviving for at least six years. And by the time you get to 2017, they looked like they were about to have a car which was quite a bit competitive. If only they had been able to survive and Mercedes provide them just that little bit of extra support, Mercedes might have had a Toro Rosso of their own. Who knows? So no, F1 cannot in good faith use that argument. Then they justify the decision by saying that the team entering in 2025 would be reckless, since they would have to develop two cars at the same time, which would be considerably difficult as a novice constructor. What did Haas do in 2016 with support from Dallara? build a car from one set of rules to only then make a brand new car for 2017 with a completely different set of rules. Now, granted, I hear you say, Dallara is an experienced chassis maker. They do this kind of stuff all the time. That's all well and good, and fair enough for Haas to partner up with the likes of Dallara for their first operation in Formula One. But it's a completely different thing to build the contents that Dallara supply you with and come together and make a coherent Formula One team. You can have all the parts, but if you don't know how to put them together, there you go. That's a whole other animal. And it isn't like Andretti is going into this with only General Motors staff backing them. Like I said, Andretti had been poaching current F1 staff from the big teams to guide them, as well as having the support of Otmar Safnauer, a seasoned and recognisable team principal. If Otmar didn't rate their operation, then he wouldn't have said anything about Andretti. He wouldn't have commented. The fact that he said, if they're successful, I would love to help them. Using the word love, that is a strong sign that Otmar has taken a look at their operations and gone like, hmm. So to use this argument in its entirety would be unfair because Haas 
with a little help from Delara, made that work, going from one set of regulations to another, which is then carried over to the other argument that FOM reckons is that Andretti simply doesn't understand the complexity of F1 and that it would be incredibly difficult to make two cars at the same time. Well, they've got a model of a car already in the wind tunnel, which is to the current specifications, which are going to be unchanged for 2025, and supposedly they will have a rolling chassis ready for the summer, which means that they are almost done by that point with developing the car for 2025, which could then go on to be potentially manufactured and then homologated and then be compliant potentially with the FIA standard crash tests. And considering that the FIA has already given them the green light to compete in Formula One, they will probably be able to go through with the crash tests and then maybe be approved and then be good to go. All they would need is a power unit of some sort which they could then probably hobby horse together, maybe take the chassis around, a functional car, and then just uh, cause a little bit of mischief somewhere. Maybe they might rock up to Cota after the American Grand Prix in 2024 and then just like roll the car around and just show like, hey, look at what we're doing, our own little private test. In a way, they've almost finished that car. And then going for 2026, the bigger teams cannot continue work on those 2026 cars until New Year's Day 2025. So really? Andretti is not losing time in terms of development since everyone else is on pause. So that argument, again, is somewhat flawed. And then the most egregious part of all of this is that F1 are basically saying that Andretti would be nothing but a moocher of the sport's popularity. That F1 would bring value to Andretti rather than Andretti bringing value to Formula One. Again, Haas, what value do they bring to the sport currently? All that Haas has really been providing Formula One for the last few years are constant headaches and PR disasters, thanks to very, very flawed and very, very silly sponsorship negotiations with the likes of Rich Energy, Euralkali, and just general complete and utter buffoonery. And yes, of course, in a way, Drive to Survive did help them in that case, but Haas haven't exactly been um, harmonious with Formula One they have caused a stink or two. Not to mention Gene's lack of ambition to provide really sustainable investment for his own team, considering that the rest of the teams around him are providing substantial investment and are attracting outside investors to provide even more money for them to be able to develop further and get closer to the top five teams. That is quite telling, that Gene's quite happy to coast at the back, that P8, oh, that would be nice if they got that, but most likely they will be last still. They have a developed car, but there's no guarantee that it'll be good. Andretti has a proven track record of success in whatever it chooses to take part in, and that Michael Andretti is not the same man he was back in 1993. And F1 only seems to care about Andretti if General Motors, badged as Cadillac in this case, enter with Andretti at the same time. But wait, General Motors is already working with Andretti on the F1 project. As that athletic article said, 50 of the 120 staff Andretti is employing right now have come from General Motors. So they are providing assistance other than the power unit itself, which of course is risky in of its own self because if General Motors decide that they get cold feet and they have to pull out, then that's a big chunk of the workforce suddenly gone. But then again, we have seen engine suppliers being flaky, Honda, on multiple occasions, so it's not exactly something new. And also, it's not like General Motors is a small automaker. You know all of the stink and hype that is being built around Red Bull powertrains partnering up with Ford? Yes, Ford is a big automaker and has a decent chunk of the share in the US as of 2022. But look who has an even bigger share of the US automaker industry. General Motors. It's a fifth bigger. General Motors is huge. And even Christian Horner is aware that General Motors is a fantastic brand. Formula One is aware that General Motors is a fantastic brand. And that they have actually tried to talk to General Motors in, hey, Instead of going with Andretti, how about you maybe just come in on your own? Which is exactly what they're doing, and yet F1.com did not mention that at all. And they made a big song and dance about Audi joining. Yeah, you can tell it's getting a bit complicated here. But in their own words, F1 wants General Motors, even though they still reckon they would not be competitive upon entry as a new supplier. But General Motors are waiting until 2028 because they want to get it right. Of course, yes, General Motors could provide a Cadillac-badged engine for Andretti in 2026, but they're probably aware that by now it would be too late to do so because most of the current manufacturers have been working on the 2026 engine for the last couple of years or so when the engine regulations were vaguely finalized. So to start now would be a really bad idea. General Motors are being careful and have recognized that 2028 would be the earliest that they could come in with a compelling power unit that isn't leagues behind. They are taking it easy, they are taking it slow and they are doing a very logical thing. 
which obviously isn't good enough. The promise of entering in the future, not enough to convince Formula One that bringing Andretti in now would be beneficial. And again, it's a slap in the face for Renault. So to me, this all looks like F1 had to throw a wall of text at us to justify something that Andretti was able to phrase in a paragraph. But when you boil it down, most of those points, in fact, nearly all of those points could be easily argued away. That F1 had to bamboozle us with text to justify that they knew that this was going to be an unpopular decision. So they had to provide meticulous detail as to why they simply could not allow Andretti in right now. That they thought that Andretti was not prepared, that Andretti would be uncompetitive. They would have to provide so much to get them to enter, just to try and stop the Red Bull domination cycle. That the only way that they can even come in is to stop Max Verstappen, to stop Red Bull. If you can't do that, then what's the point? Because F1 really needs somebody to stop Max Verstappen and Red Bull without changing the rules. And again, that whole thing about the December the 12th meeting and Andretti not accepting the invitation, take that with a pinch of salt, because we don't know the details as to what that meeting would entail. So whatever is happening here, the FIA is not done with this decision. Andretti are going to continue developing. And I bet your bottom dollar that they are going to be very vocal as to what they get up to. When we see that rolling chassis in the summer, we are going to know about it. We may even see a rolling car with an old customer engine or just a randomly placed engine from one of their Indy cars that they just slot in or something like that. We might even see a functional car to some extent after the Austin Grand Prix. I would really like to see that in a way, just to see Andretti causing a little bit of mischief. Sure, it's ugly, it's not ideal. I would love for them to just simply have a good, smooth application process and get into Formula 1 legitimately. But Formula 1 has made it clear that they are not going to play by the rules and the FIA is going to get involved. This is just going to be another chapter in the Ben Suliam and Stefano Domenicali feud. And that is not great. But sometimes things like this doesn't end pretty. Why are the FIA and Formula One management at loggerheads with one another? Well, to clue yourself up with that chestnut before all the Andretti mess came about, go and watch this video next and you might realize why things could get ugly.